I'll start to let them in. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Daniel, thank you for putting a camera on. I love it already. Look at that. Hi, guys. Welcome as you guys are popping in. It's just about four o'clock. So just to make sure you guys are all in the right place, I did put a message in the waiting room. This is the Rutgers Business School session for business analytics and information technology, what we refer to as BAIT. So hopefully um, you guys are gonna get a lot of your questions asked. We have Professor Galani on with us. So I am gonna turn it over to him so that he can explain a little bit more about the major career opportunities, what students are interested in. And then when he's done, we'll be able to have you guys either unmute yourself um, turn your cameras on, hopefully, ask some questions. If you have questions while he's um, discussing his presentation, just put them in the chat box. I'll be able to moderate that and make sure that he can address any questions or concerns that you have. But congratulations to you guys being newly admitted students. You have all worked hard, so congratulations. The field was very competitive for admissions this year, so congrats to all of you. And best of luck as you guys are in the final stretch with decision day coming on May 1st. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Galani. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Vijahat Galani. My students call me Waj or Professor Galani, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, first of all, congratulations on being accepted. And hopefully I can help you answer some of your questions on this program, possibly other programs to try to give you an idea of where you want to go and how you want to do it. Now, real quick, just to introduce myself, I am, I, I'm a product of Rutgers through and through. <laughs> I did my undergrad at Rutgers. I did my master's at Rutgers. And I did my PhD at Rutgers. Now they got me teaching at Rutgers. <laughs> Eventually I'm going to have to leave. I just can't take it anymore. Our football team is just not cutting it. Right. So I, although we've, we've probably gotten a little bit better. Right. And our New York teams are looking better. Our New York teams are looking better. So I'm a big football fan. Um, in terms of my professional career, I, was, I worked at Merrill Lynch right out the, right out the gate after my undergrad. Uh, they don't exist anymore. They were bought out by Bank of New York, except for my division, which, which, which was the um, asset management division. They actually got bought out by BlackRock. I don't know if where, you, where you guys live. Any of you guys are, live around Route 1 in the Princeton area. You see this beautiful BlackRock building on Route 1 new building, shiny building. That's where a lot of my old bosses went. Bobby Dahl, he's still there. Um, after that, I went to JP Morgan and Chase for a while. You guys know JP Morgan and Chase. I went there to structure uh, what we call asset-backed securities, which is something that you guys probably don't never heard of unless you watch the movie, The Big Short, right? But for anybody in the business world in 2000, 2007, 2008, asset-backed security or CDOs is a big, huge buzzword because they almost destroyed the financial world. So. Um, you guys probably don't know this, but unless you watch one of those movies, but I mean, eventually, depending on where you guys go, you'll, you'll learn more about this. It's, it's, it's history at this point. Um, after that, after a year, we weren't really structuring. So I ended up going to a place called, uh, a small place called Libertas Partners out in Greenwich, Connecticut, which has its own history in itself in the financial world for a small hedge fund slash broker dealer, where I was a desk quant uh, pricing, what we call aspect securities and CDOs. Again, same securities on a trading desk. That I was there on that desk when actually everything was really reaching its, I would say, height of insanity. But I have happened to be on the right side of the trade. Our department was on the, our firm was on the right side of the trade. So I saw a lot of money being made. <laughs> I have stories and I say those stories in class in a very G rated manner because things got a little crazy. Things got a little crazy back then. So I keep it clean. I keep it clean. All right. Um, I left there. Uh, they offered me my own book. That basically means that's financial speak that the firm is going to give you their own capital to trade with. Uh, that's a big deal because you don't make, you don't get wealthy by trading your own money. You grow your wealth by trading your money, which you should. You guys should always invest, grow your wealth. If anything, this past year in the pandemic, you guys have seen the power of the stock market, right? But you, you get truly wealthy one of two ways. You get wealthy if you trade 
other people's money, right? And that's just the law of large numbers, right? If you make 1% on like 100 bucks, it's just a buck. You make 1% on 100 million bucks. Now we're talking, that's Ferrari right there, right? So that's why that's a big deal. When you trade, when the firm says, we're going to give you your own book to trade, that means the firm's going to give you a tremendous amount of money to trade with. So I turned them down. They're like, you're crazy. I'm like, I'm crazy, but I wanted to do my PhD. I thought I could knock it out in three years. I was very arrogant back then. It ended up taking like seven, eight years. Almost got kicked out twice. My, my advisor was awesome, Professor Kari Hakis. He's actually the chairperson of MSIS. So he uh, pushed me, put me in a headlock and made me finish my PhD. So uh, I finished my PhD, but I was consulting with different uh, hedge funds because I just, just because of my, uh, my skill set, the stuff I knew with AB, ABS and CDO securities, because they're, you know, they're still hot in the market. Not so much now, but even around then, they were still pretty much hot. And I had the expertise and knowledge in the software and the math to price these securities. So you know, I started consulting for different hedge funds. I did that during the, throughout my PhD. I eventually hooked up with another hedge fund. That's what we call a multi-strategy hedge fund. And I'm sorry, you, a lot of you guys probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but if you go, some of you guys go the finance route, you, some of this stuff, you will understand what I'm talking about. And um, so uh, long story short, worked with them for a while, met incredible, um, I would say, I met, I met like rock stars in the uh, quant world, in the quant quantitative financial world, like big names. Um, I met some politicians, very interesting stories. I can't talk about some of them because of the NDAs, <laughs> right? But um, it was a great experience. They're still my advisor. They're still, they still advise me that the hedge funds still advise me. Actually, I, I'm still working with them on some small projects. But uh, now I just privately manage um, what I would call, I, I, I would say like I'm an over, over glorified consultant for institutional investors that actually invest and invest and actually create their own digital assets and platforms. So I kind of manage them. I kind of manage some of the platforms in some case, in some case, I have joint ventures with other institutional investors or other corporations that have digital assets and platforms where for one reason or another, strategic reason or another, they, they need to have these assets or platforms, if you will, to be separated from a brand point of view from their brand, right? And just, that just goes into the business and the strategy of what's going on. So I work in that space now. It still kind of involves a lot of my quantitative analysis and quantitative, the quant work I used to do back in the days with equity. I still do it in this space with digital assets and platforms. All right. Oh, sorry, one second. There you go. All right, sorry about that. So um, that's me professionally. And also I teach at Rutgers Business School uh, in, in the middle of all of this. So um, that's my experience. And I'm a professor in the bait department. Technically, I only teach we, at the way our divisions, our, our departments work, whether it's bait, finance, marketing, the way it works. So we're, we manage both the undergrad, the master's and the PhD programs. So our particular program, the bait program, it's really under what we call the MSIS, MSIS department, Management Science of Information Systems. And the undergrad program is bait, business analytics and IT. All right. And firstly, let me explain where this program came from. All right. This, Professor Eckstein actually created the program, but the reason, the purpose behind the program is, is that in the business school, a lot of these silos you guys see, accounting, marketing, finance, they are actually kind of aligned with what we call the executive suite, the C-suite. You guys heard the term CEOs, chief executive officer, CFO, chief financial officer, CMO, chief marketing officer, et cetera, et cetera, CCO, chief compliance officer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These branches within business schools, they kind of correlate with these exec executive suites, right? So where does BAIT come in? BAIT is an answer to the new executive suites that are you, you start, you're going to start hearing about in corporations called CDO or say CAO, Chief Data Officer or Chief Analytics Officer, which in corporate America is the growing departments. Like those departments are like exploding. They're growing and they're exploding and they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. They have no idea what they're supposed to be doing because it's such new fields, right? So corporate America is trying to figure it out. Academia is trying to figure it out. But either way, it's, it's very exciting. So enter BAIT, what we do. I teach one class at the undergrad level. The rest of the classes I teach at the master's level. But the, the class I teach is investment modeling and art. It's an elective. But the core focus of BAIT is, and you, I don't know if you guys looked at some of the, the classes that we teach. You'll notice that there's Python programming classes. There's our programming classes, right? 
but these classes, they tend to be linked in, aside, for the, aside, aside from the foundations class, which is the Pyth essentially Python programming or, and the, the foundations and fundamentals of coding. The other classes tend to be linked in some sort of math or statistical concept, right? For example, BDAO, business decision under uncertainty. It's a Python class, but it's a Python class that basically teaches you optimization when you're making uh, decisions, when you have to make decisions in a project, in a business, in a project, for example, should a company open up a hotel in location A or location B or location C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, questions like that, right? And the reason why our classes are structured like this is because what Bait tries to answer as a subject area, as a, as a, not, as, not only as a degree, but as a, as a problem solver is the, the problem of data and decisions, right? Data and decisions. I don't have to tell your generation of all people, the explosion of data, right? And the type of data we're dealing with and seeing both in personal world, social media world, and the business world, especially the business world, right? I don't know if any of you guys trade stocks. If you guys saw the blow up that happened with the Robin Hood, the, the meme trades, right? GameStop, all that stuff, right? And then all of a sudden, all these games, all these uh, Robin Hood traders found out, oh, wait a minute, you're selling our information? <laughs> of course, we're selling your information. These are multi-billion dollars companies. Why do you think Facebook and all these companies are multi-billion dollars, right? They're selling your freaking information. Nothing is truly free. Right, nothing is truly free. You guys are, I just happen to be, you know, you guys happen to be the commodity. <laughs> you guys have, your, your private information tends to be the, uh, what's valuable. So given all this data and given the perceived, true or false, but the perceived value in all this data, how does business use this data to make decisions? Right, that's the fundamental, that's the fundamental question. This is something we've been doing forever. Right? Whatever information a business has, they try to take that information, they try to make a decision out of it. Right? But given the fact this explosion of data, and this data is something that we've never, like, it's in structures we haven't seen before. Video, YouTube video, and now you guys are dancing on TikTok for crying out loud. Right? How do you take that data and analyze it? That's the question business analytics and IT, well, the whole field of data science is trying to, is trying to answer taking these large amounts of unstructured data, sorting through them, structuring them, trying to normalize them in such a way that we can then apply our traditional means of statistics and analysis on them and try to make some sort of business decision, right? That's what BAIT is basically about. And we try to teach it in a way for undergrads, right? For undergrads, because you guys are all new to this, right? Some of you guys are new to this kind of programming. Obviously you guys are new to the concept of the mathematical optimization. Statistics, some of you guys have taken, congratulations if you've taken it in high school. Um, you'll see it's stats again, a lot of stats because all these data sciences, these algorithms are, are built off stats, right? And mathematics and the science of mathematics. Um, and so this is why when you drill down to the actual classes, you'll see the classes we have, for, ex for example, MIS. What is MIS? SQL, SQL, databases, right? Traditional databases. You guys learn all that, you guys learn about that. I already talked about decision-making with using Python, BDAO. Time series, we have a time series class using R. Why time series? What is a time series? Time series is just data that is associated with some sort of point in time. Like for example, stock data, financial data, right? In fact, majority of the data you guys deal, deal with in the work and, and when you start working will be time series related data. So we have a separate class on time series and all the math around that, right? Um, I, have, I have a separate elective investment modeling in R. That's just a class for any for students interested in the stock market and the quantitative aspects of using data to try to build screening, I would say screening methodologies in the stock market. Again, it's the intersection of data, the intersection of programming, and the intersection of making decisions, right? How do we deal with all this data? It's programming. So some of you are comp sci, are, are, are potentially will be comp sci majors also, right? So we teach programming, comp sci teaches programming. What's the difference? Firstly, CompSci gets more involved in the algorithms, right? What does it mean to make a, um, a program or a construct in a program more efficient? For example, sorting, sorting numbers or sorting anything, right? There's a whole bunch of algorithms out there, bubble sort, quick sort, around, these, around the idea of making a certain piece of code faster and more efficient, right? But more importantly, it's what the end product is. In computer science, the software is the product, 
right? You're using programming to create something that's the product, that's CompSci, right? Ideally, that's what CompSci is. What is, what are we doing? What, what are we using programming for in bait? The programming uh, result, the programming product is not the product. It's merely the tool, right? What's truly the product in bait, the analysis. That's the difference between the coding, the purposes between the programming you're learning in CompSci versus bait. In for bait, the programming is merely the tool. In CompSci, whatever software you're designing or making, that is the product. That is the product. Whereas in bait, it's the analysis, right? It always comes down to analysis. And this is why a lot of the companies actually recruit, actually the big four consulting companies, they just can't get enough of our, our bait students. A lot of these consulting companies, KPMG, Deloitte, e &Y, they grab our students. They want as many bait students as they possibly can. Now, why is this, right? They don't do any programming. <laughs> they don't do any programming in Python and R. They do some programming, but they consult, they consult on the idea of the programming, tech advisory, risk advisory, finance, all these things. But why do they want our students? They want our students because um, one of the big businesses of consulting companies is to sell certain prepackaged products and solutions, certain software. Think Tableau. Have you guys heard of Tableau? You will hear of Tableau. You'll hear about it forever once you guys start college, right? Um, and the idea with these consulting companies, they want to sell these certain software or tool sets to these corporations, and then they want to sell training. Like they want, to, they want to sell basically the training to their employees via their consulting company, right? So why do, they, why do they hire a lot of our students? Because a lot of our students already have a background in R, Python, and SQL for the purposes of solving a solution. And these consulting companies, they have confidence that, look, if a student knows how to program in R and Python, and they understand SQL, then whatever software they throw at them, right, to use or to show others to use, they can manage, right? And the purpose behind those softwares that they, these corporations are buying from these consulting companies is to do analysis. It's basically to do, to do analysis. So this is one of the reasons why these big consulting companies, they love our students because our students have the understanding of programming and analytics in the space of a problem, a business, a business solving problem space, right? A business solving problem space. And so that's why a majority of our students actually end up going to consulting, uh, to these consulting companies. But they also go to some other cool places. I have one student that he's working for the Oklahoma Thunder, doing data analytics for Oklahoma, Oklahoma Thunder. I had another student that was about to start working for the Mets, but then he actually got poached by IBM. I got, we have some students in the financial, obviously we have students in the financial world at different investment banks, some at our different investment funds, right? Again, applying, applying programming analytics. I have two students at Audible. I have two students at Audible. You know Audible, the Amazon company? They're in Newark. So they're there and they're working on all the latest and new cutting edge stuff. Audible is always trying to be more innovative, right? It's a very innovative uh, oriented company. I had one grad student that went to Tesla. <laughs> uh, so they got to meet Elon Musk. Interesting story, interesting story. So our students actually go all over the place outside of the consultant company. The consultant companies, they just lower you because they always try to give you the bigger package. But again, it's open to wherever you want to go because which company, which industry is not using data and science analytics now? Everybody is. I have just, I have, I just, another student just recently reached out to me. She wants resumes, right? Why does she, what does she want res resumes for? She wants resumes for the luxury company, Volger? Bugari, how do you say that company again? I forgot. It's a luxury brand. I'm going to look it up right now. I think it's Bulgari. Bulgari, yes, yeah, Bulgari, right? Which, again, if you haven't heard of it, you will. It's a very expensive brand. But they're not just Bulgari, but also Coach and Chanel, I know they're get investing more and more in their data analytics. These traditional luxury houses that consider themselves more artisanal than anything else, right? Artisanal than anything else. Like they, look, they look down upon mass production, let alone data analytics. They're embracing data, data analytics like never before because they see all the different ways data analytics can enhance their business. In their case, in the luxury, in the luxury sector, it's, it's, they, they realize that they can use data analytics to enhance their brand. And that's something they love. These guys, in the luxury space, the luxury business, you always want to, you always have to defend and protect your brand. The brand is what it's all about. 
right? If there's a, if there's a bag that's a Chanel bag, right? The brand is Chanel bag. You got to protect that quality and the, the perception of quality, right? And because, the, because perception is so, is, uh, is uh, in anything, politics, business, because perception is, is so affected by what's happening in social media now, because of your generation, right? These companies have no choice but to be involved in the social media space in a smart, stealth way to always protect their brands. So this is happening everywhere. So wherever you go, wherever you see data science and data analytics, that's basically where you see our student base can go. And that is why, even though students, they tend to choose other majors like marketing and finance, they at least do a, like a, what I, I think it's not called a minor, it's called a concentration in BAE. They do, we don't have minors in the business school, but we have something called concentration. Like you can be a BAE major and then concentrate in finance, or you could be a, like a marketing major and concentrate in BAE. So you have these options. So this is why every, even other departments, a lot of their students, they at least do a concentration in BAE just to get this kind of exposure. More importantly, just throw it on their resume. People find it impressive. <laughs> so, I mean, that's my little song and dance. I don't want to talk too much because you guys, people have been probably talking to you guys all day or all week. So I, I just want to open it up now. And if there's any questions, do you have any questions about, uh, about the program and about the, or the subject material itself related to the industry? Go ahead, shoot. No uh, questions. The moment, oh, there we at go. The moment, I don't have any questions right now. Uh, it was a really um, fun, you know, little presentation to listen to. Uh, but um, is there any way, like, let's say, you know, I have any questions down the road? Uh, any way I can contact you? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think the and I think Christine, you have my MB, you have my business school address, right? Um, I have the one that you gave to set us up for this link. I don't think it's your business school address, but I can get it offline and I can put it in the the chat box. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the one at business.rutgers.edu. Why did business? Okay. Yeah, that one. Okay. okay. Hey, cool. you can shoot me an email. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to ask something. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. So uh, you spoke about Python, that program. What is the most common program like for all the companies analytics use is like the best? All right. So that's a great question. Okay. So, so right now we, we like to have our students have three things on their resume, SQL, R, and Python, right? SQL, first of all, is everywhere. Whether you do it or not, SQL is everywhere. So we always like to have, make sure our students have SQL on the resume. In terms of popularity, Python by far, I would say controls about 70 to 80% in terms of analytics, 70 to 80% of the market, right? 70 to 80% of the market. Uh, 20 to 30%, I would say R is, it falls under R programming. But that's only for companies that are using Python and R. Other companies, they tend to be use some, some of their own proprietary or third-party tools. For example, Tableau. Tableau is massive. People love Tableau. Tableau pisses me off because it's just a really slick version of Excel. And I could have made it and been a billionaire but I was too stupid to realize that. I was too stupid to realize that. Tableau is the biggest con ever, but still very important to learn. Right? Very important to learn. It's very important. And by the way, it's not something you learn anyway. It's just something so easy to use. It's like Excel. It's like a very beautiful version of Excel. And I, I, I totally admit it makes very beautiful graphs and it's so easy to use. But that's an example of something that corporations, like they use a third-party tool like Tableau. Nevertheless, even though these corporations they use third-party tools, like I was explaining before with the consulting companies, they are always, when, and when it comes to teaching, right? When you're coming out of school, we always like to oversell you guys, right? We can show you, we can give you a workshop on Tableau and show you Tableau, but these corporations know that, hey, if you can do R, you can do Python, you can do SQL, then of course you can pick up Tableau, right? So our idea is always to oversell you guys and then let these corporations take you and work on any kind of Disney kind of application, right? Any like easy, software like tableau right because at the end of the day you guys still have the the th you guys at least think like analysts as data scientists or data analysts right and even no matter even no matter what tool you're using but python by far is i would say is about 70 percent of the market um Thanks. no problem actually one funny story i was interviewing for a hedge fund for an analyst and the hedge fund manager was like watch make sure the, the student the guy knows how to do python and i'm like why you guys don't do Python here. He's like, yeah, but it's hot, right? 
He had no idea who Python is. I'm like, all right, buddy, you're the millionaire. You want somebody who knows Python, you got it, buddy, right? So like, that's an example of what I'm talking about, all right? And also a lot of time, and a lot of firms, they, a lot of firms, they, were, they want people that know Python. When, but when they get hired, they don't even do any Python. But I mean, that's corporate America for you. I can give you a whole store side story about corporate America, how crazy it is. So we did get another question. We have a student that is thinking about double majoring in bait and finance, but wants to know if you think that maybe majoring in one and concentrating in the other would be a better pathway. So I couldn't really tell you. Uh, that really depends on you and your situation. Uh, just so you know, I think bait and finance double majoring is the most, I think that's probably the most popular double major we see with the bait students. A lot of them tend to be finance and, and bait double majors. I think second after that is, a long second after that is probably marketing and bait, marketing and bait. But I, I don't have the exact numbers, but I know it's finance and bait. Like when I, when I come to class, majority of my class tends to be either double majors in finance and bait or finance and a bait concentration. Again, I can't really understand. I can't really explain to you. I can't really answer for you whether you should do the double major or you should do a concentration. That you'll see once you get into the classes, right? Because this is like, all right, this, this is what happens, right? So this is usually what happens. So when you start the classes, right? Like for example, let me, I'm gonna say it from the point of view of a finance student. So from the point of view of a finance student, they might be like, I'm gonna do finance and I'm gonna do bait. I'm gonna double major. But they might find that they like one more than the other, right? For example, let's say they like just the finance stuff more than bait. They're not really into the programming and the math and all this stuff, right? So they might say, you know what? I might not want to do the major because some of these classes are hard. And some of these classes, I wouldn't say hard, but they're a little more complex because you're, you're blending math and, uh, you're, you know, math, programming, and analysis. And this is one of the reasons why out the gate, I'm going to show off here a little bit, out the gate, why our undergrads tend to, they tend to be offered packages that are higher than the other majors, right? A little bragging over there. Right, because of the complexity and you know the complexity in the skill set, et cetera, et cetera. So, if for a lot of students, if they're not feeling these bait classes, what they'll do is, you know what, I'll keep the bait concentration, which is a fewer, more targeted classes. So I still have bait on my resume, and then I'll concentrate on my other major, right? Or it might flip. They might be like, oh, I, I like the programming aspect and the analytical aspect more in bait versus the stuff, the financial theory stuff we're learning in finance. So maybe I'll keep the concentration in finance, and I'll, I'll, I'll just major in bait, right? Or either, or you might love, you like, might like, might you, you might like both majors. You really might like the classes, the, like the classes you're taking, and you'll stick with the double major. So that's why that's something I can't really answer for yourself. I, I can't answer for you. You have to answer that for yourself, and it'll become more evident once you start taking these classes. It would come, it become much more evident which route you'll take or you should take. I know, Professor, a question I get a lot also is some students shy away from the bait major because they think it's so technical. I don't want to write code. And you've kind of mentioned Python and, and, and these different languages. What if I'm not that techie? Is bait the right major for me? So our, our classes are like some, again, depending on which high school you went to, which program you went to, some of you guys already took a couple comp sci classes. Some of you guys are doing programming, but our program, is geared towards non-programmers, people that are new to this. For example, my elective, I assume zero programming knowledge, right? So somebody that's completely new, they're gonna start learning programming. And again, the point is not the programming. Even though we talk about programming a lot, the point, this is business school at the end of the day, right? The point is not programming. The point is answering a business or solving some, a problem in the business world by using programming. That's what it's all about, right? It's analysis. Take, for example, your TI, do you guys still use TI-85s in high school? I'm old. I don't, I don't know what's going on anymore. You guys still have your graphing calculators in high school? TI-84s, yeah. yeah. TI-84s? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't it the 85? What happened? Uh, we've been using 84s. I mean, I don't, I don't even know there was a TI-85. All right, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I just made it up. Why are you here? <laughs> All right. All right. So I think I'm just probably making up numbers. So, so think about the way you guys use your graphing calculator. Right? What are you using your graphic calculator? You're using to solve a problem. The problems in the business world are just more complex. You need something a little more powerful. And let's be honest here, right? I'm from Wall Street. We like, we like solutions that are as easy as possible. We want to do the minimal amount of thinking as possible, right? 
want to spend their time spending money, not programming. So you want tools that are not only give you more power, but they give you a more power with less amount of programming, less amount of complexity. That's the whole point. And again, that's why we use R. And when I talk about Python, we, I, I'm very specific about which Python we, we're talking about. We're talking about NumPy and Pandas. These packages that are NumPy and Pandas that are more, uh, I would say, processing and business friendly. So even the programming we do, the programming we do is meant to be as small and concise as possible and do as much analysis as it possibly can. We want to get the most bang out of our buck in the time type of coding we're doing. Again, we are not the people that do a, a million lines of code and deliver a alternative to Microsoft Word. That's not our space. That's CompSci. That's CompSci. We are the people that say, hey, um, given all these YouTube videos on certain stocks, right, that people are talking about certain stocks, what is the general sentiment of you think of these, of these people that are watching these YouTube videos in terms of where a particular, let's take, let's take Tesla, whether Tesla is going to perform well in the coming months or not perform well in the coming months? That's the questions we want to ask, right? How do we do it? We're freaking, we're traders and investors. We're not going to write a million lines of code. We got to get that answer fast. How do we do it? That's what bait is all about. Now, granted, we probably won't get to that point as an undergrad, but that's the path we're sending you guys on. That's the whole idea behind this, behind bait. So we got another question, Professor, following that up. What is your opinion on minoring in comp sci and majoring in bait? Oh, it's a fantastic combo. Fantastic combo. I mean, I'm a little biased in the sense that, okay, I do teach at Bait, but I did Rutgers undergrad. Uh, I did a BS in comp sci at Rutgers as well, right? And granted, it was many, many moons ago. Right? Um, the program was fantastic. And um, the comp, always having a fundamental, like a degree in comp sci is always great. And you can always go so many more, different, different, you can always go any path you want once you, get, you have a comp sci degree. So I would love it, it'd be great. And, What's great about that is when you do an undergrad in comp sci, which is harder, a harder route, um, the programming aspect of bait classes become that much easier, that much easier. So yeah, that's a fantastic combination. Fantastic combination. Okay. Anyone else have a question that they want to put in the chat box or unmute themselves and ask? So these are all seniors. I'm talking to? We have some seniors and some transfer students possibly, but they are admitted students. So they all right. will all be starting in their first semester in the fall. Oh man, you guys are starting at a crazy time. This is history going on for you people, right? <laughs> we broke the world <laughs> and now you guys have to deal with it. <laughs> no, but it'll be great. It'll be great. I think you guys, uh, they talk about your generation being like the lost generation because you guys are losing a lot of stuff. Like you guys lost all those social events, prom, suckers, right? <laughs> all, <laughs> right, all this stuff. But uh, it'll be great because you guys, what always happens in history, whenever there is some sort of strange thing going on or some sort of adversity you guys are dealing with, that generation always ends up changing the game one way or another, right? Because of the fact that you guys had just had to deal with circumstances that nobody else had to deal with, it forces you guys to think and live in ways that nobody would have. It, it's external factors forcing you to change the way you guys think and do things. These things making you guys, you know, think and live differently, it imprints on you and it allows you to see things that other people, our generation just can't see. And you guys end up doing just fantastic, great things. So even if you're bummed about what happened to you guys, what we did to you, right? The virus might escape the lab, <laughs> right? Funded by America, <laughs> right? These conspiracy theories, whatever. In the end, I assure you that you guys will do great things because of this. I assure you. I keep telling all the, I keep telling the younger generation this. You're very, you know, you guys feel like you guys, you guys missed out on a lot, but in the end, you guys will actually come out stronger and you guys are gonna do some great innovative things. Hands down, I'm betting on that. So we did get a question. How are the internship and co-op opportunities that come with a bait major? Oh, I mean, they're fantastic. In general, I mean, I think RBS does a great job with our internship, with our internship uh, opportunities. They're great. 
In fact, I mean, ideally the system is this, you're supposed to get your, I was it not junior year. I think it's junior year fall by fall semester, you should lock in your internship, right? You lock up your internship through career services. Um, and then you go, you do your internship between your junior and senior year, you come back your senior year, you have an offer or you check out other offers for full-time offers. But in terms of the internships positions, I mean, they're fantastic. So my, my student that got the full-time offer from Oklahoma Thunder, he had, originally, he was interning at the NBA, at, at the actual NBA. He was interning at the actual NBA. My student that, one of my students that got an offer from Goldman Sachs, they were interning at Goldman Sachs. And then they got their, their offer from Goldman Sachs. And then obviously a lot of these students, they get internships at the, also the consulting companies. They offered tons of in, internships to our, to our students. So in terms of our uh, internships, where our students go, again, it's the same thing. They can go anywhere. In fact, I think in terms of internships, we get much wider spectrum of internships than we do in our full-time offers, just because a lot of times, a lot of times internships are used by corporations as a way to market the corporation itself, right? To market the corporation itself. So you, you, t you tend to see like some of the strangest internships out there, which is whatever, for each, to each their own. But I think in terms of internship, I mean, it's, you have incredible flexibility, incredible flexibility. In fact, I have, um, I have students that just do a bait major and they just apply to financial companies and they get financial interns and they get financial full-time jobs. Same concept, right? Especially since now all these investment banks have rebranded themselves as tech companies, right? Tech companies. So it's not, it's not siloed as you think it is in the business world, in, in RBS. It's not siloed as you think it is. If anything, and again, take this with a grain of salt because I'm from the Bay Department, I feel that the Bay students, actually, they're more like Navy SEALs in the sense that they can technically apply anywhere and go to any career services because just because of the fact that corporations and HR departments are looking for students that have that kind of background that we provide. Again, take that with a grain of salt, slightly, prejud slightly prejudicial, right? So we did get another question, the reverse of, how do you feel about majoring in comp sci, but minoring in BAIT? And just to let you students know, you can't do a minor in BAIT. The only minor you can do is business administration. So you can do a double major um, in BAIT and comp sci or major in BAIT and minor in comp sci, but if you want to do anything with fate, you have to be part of the business school. But what would be your thought, I guess, on maybe focusing more on the comp sci, being that you are a comp sci guy? Um, yeah, so firstly, thank you. I, like, I was about to say that. I don't think you could do that. <laughs> thank you for right. answering that. Yeah, I don't think you could do that. Um, but look, if you just want to do a comp sci route. So I did a double major in comp sci and economics, right? I did a double major in comp sci and economics. I love economics even though the field itself makes no sense in terms of application. I just, I, I love the, at least the concept and theory behind it. And I love comp sci in terms of, I was always naturally good at math and it was just really cool being able to create something so quick. I don't know if you guys, you guys have done programming. It's just really sweet when you actually make something, right? So I really like that, the whole concept. And also I'm really lazy, extremely lazy, right? The idea of programming something once and it doing all my work over and over again was just awesome. CompSite was made for people like me, right? You know how they always talk about you in these job recs, they talk about somebody who has extreme attention to detail, right? Yeah, I always want to meet these people. I'm not that person, right? But when you program something that is, is right, then you don't have to care about it. You don't have to worry about the details, right? Sweat the small stuff. So. CompSci economics just talked to me. If CompSci just, if that's something you just love and you just want to do, run with it, run with it. In general, you guys have to understand that the way the business world is now, what you start off doing most likely is not something you're going to finish up with, right? The corporate America is crazy right now, right? In fact, I yell at my students that, look, after your first two, three years, you must, you must go to another corporation unless they've given you a sweet package to corporate America, right? The fact, like this, those days of staying at a place for like 15, 20 years, they don't exist anymore. Corporate America does not work like that anymore, right? So, and also your careers are constantly shifting, 
right? And data is a, a huge part of data and automation are a huge part of this, right? The fields, there are new fields popping up that a few years did not exist. There's fields that exist right now that probably will be gone in a, in a couple, like five, six, seven years, right? Or so career, sub, sub careers, if you will, in corporate America. So whatever you're starting off with, it doesn't mean that's what you're going to end up doing in 10 to 15 years. I can almost guarantee that for you guys. What's more important here, what's more important is that you guys are constantly learning and evolving your skill sets, right? Learning and evolving your skill sets um, with, the, with a focus, if you will. There's some things you guys are always naturally good at in terms of that, that have great market value. Some of you guys might be great at juggling. I, I don't mean something like that. I don't think you get paid well for juggling, right? But there's, there's things that you guys are naturally good at that has good market appeal, right? You need to hone that skill set. You need to hone that skill set and then go somewhere where that skill set is appreciated. If CompSci, if you turn out to be love programming and you can become a great programmer, go for it, right? And then find a place that will compensate you well for being a great, a great programmer, right? That's the, whole, that's, the whole, uh, that's the whole idea behind it. For me, I like, I like programming. But I'm not even programming to like, I'm not making software or anything like that. I'm programming just massive amount of data just to basically uh, solve data analysis problems, right? For example, um, should we buy Tesla, right? Or where we see the price of Tesla or Neo being at, at the end of the year, right? I'm doing tremendous amount of programming trying to solve that problem, trying to answer that question, right? It's not something I would have ever thought I was doing when I was in my undergrad. Right, especially with the way we were taught. We were taught, we were, the way we were taught, like we're doing software engineering, all this stuff. But it's, it's just the way things work out. So I would always strongly recommend, well, firstly, don't ever follow your passion, right? When I find, when I find the person that goes around saying that, I'm gonna kick them in the head, right? Don't follow your passion, right? You guys don't know what your passion is. I'm not talking down to you, right? I've been in your shoes. You don't know what your passion is. You will become passionate at whatever you're great at. That is what passion ends up being. You will be passionate about whatever you, whatever you end up being great at. I know a plumber, never grad, went to college. He makes, multi, he makes a couple million dollars a year. A couple million dollars a year, easy, without doing anything. Why? Because his father was a plumber, and he would drag him out everywhere to work on plumbing pipes. Well, it worked, it, it, it worked out in the sense that he was actually very good at geometry, right? And he was very, and he worked with his father on these pipes, he ended up, you know, obviously working as a plumber, but he was a damn good plumber. He actually came up with his own patents, right? I know it's weird. A plumber that owns his own patents, what's going on? And these companies, massive companies license his patents. So without going, without leaving his, his house, the guy automatically makes a couple million dollars a year. Why? And what was his passion? Plumbing was never his passion. He hated it. His father made him do it, but he was just damn good at it, right? And in fact, now you have, I don't know if you guys know, ever been to Las Vegas, I don't even know if Las Vegas is open right now, but you guys still see those big water fountain shows in Las Vegas and Dubai, they have them, right? Those, those big resorts and casinos, they call people like him to come, come in and say, listen, how are we going to do this project like this, right? So again, his passion wasn't plumbing, but it turns out he was just damn good at it. And now it's something he is passionate about. He can talk about it. He talks with me, but he can talk about water dynamics for hours and hours and hours, right? So um, I'm sorry, I went off, we totally went off track here, but listen, if you want to do comp as a major and, and you're, and you're, that's something you feel like that's, that is, uh, something you're calling, go for it. You can always switch because the great thing about a lot of the comp sci classes is I think a lot, one of them comp sci 111 is actually can be used as a foundation class or prerequisite for one of our other classes. And it could allow you to not take some classes in the business school. So you have some of this flexibility when you're starting off. So don't feel like, you know, whatever path you choose that you're locked in, you're not. You have flexibility there. So we got another question. Is bait mostly concentrated with jobs in the Northeast? And how does that connect with the road to Silicon Valley? Um, absolutely not, right? Their bait is not concentrated, is not constrained by any location, right? Bait is not concentrated by any uh, location. How, what does it have to do with Silicon Valley? It goes back to our skill set. Right. When you think about when you think about Silicon Valley, these startups, they hire, they need to, they need all, they need, I, I would say, people with skills from all different backgrounds. Right. 
you always okay look in tv you always see the programmer the bro the programmers if you will fellas right drinking like the red bulls and just staying up all night programming but there's more to it you need marketing first off when we're talking about a startup marketing is probably the single most important aspect of it marketing needs to be built into the product and service right most startups fail not because there's the not because of the product or service they made they made isn't good in fact they're probably fantastic right it's because they weren't made or designed with marketing or the user experience um, in, integrated into the product and service, right? Accounting. Again, I always make fun of accountants. I always make fun of the accounting department. You will see why once you guys take some accounting classes. <laughs> great, great bunch of people, right? But um, accounting, look, it's boring. It's not that, you know, it's not that shiny, but it's critical. Right. If you talk about venture capitalists and private equity managers, what's the first thing they look at? The fundamentals, the financial statements, right? What these accountants, what the accountants produce. That is the first thing that's looked at, right? Before anything else, uh, or one of the first things. So, first of all, bait is not bait or any career. It's not concentrated just in the Northeast. Bait is you can apply for jobs bait all over throughout throughout America. In fact, with this whole pandemic thing, oh my God, the shift in locations and these corporations as it was actually a lot of corporations were leaving the Northeast and some were leaving the West Coast. And now it's just been accelerated. Now it's just been accelerated. So um, whatever you do, like I actually, I actually have one student working for Texas Instruments in Texas, right? I have one student down in Texas Instruments working with Texas. So bait is not, you're not forced to be in the Northeast by any means, right? By any means. In fact, a lot of these corporations are moving from the Northeast throughout, throughout, um, Midwest America. And same thing with Silicon Valley. You guys, I don't know if you guys have seen what's going on in California, but there's a mass exodus of companies and people from California. A lot of them are heading down to Texas, right? I don't know if you guys heard, a lot of them are leading down to Texas. There's some, well, one of the famous, I don't know if you guys are into MMA, but one of the famous podcasters, Joe Rogan, that guy left California. Elon Musk, he left California. All these people are leaving, all these people are leaving California, right? Because the pandemic has shown that, you know what, some corporations, some businesses, they can be done um, over distance, over Zoom. Some corporations don't agree with this. I know some companies, they are actually, they're planning to have their, their employees vaccinated, have them back in the office. Again, it depends on the different corporation. But in terms, of, um, in terms of the Northeast, no, BAIT is not concentrated in the Northeast. In terms of Silicon Valley, the skill sets you learn, programming, analytics, 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 right? Is very hot in Silicon Valley. It's very hot in Silicon. You can only you can, you can only have so many Uber apps, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you can only have so many Uber apps. What's growing now in Silicon Valley? The startups are your B two B data analysis, data science applications. Who are they going to hire for that? Right? It's going to be people that are, that are actually well versed at least the program asset, a programming aspect and the analytics aspect of that space. So that's how, that's how it links in. Right? That's how it links in. Funny, you actually, you mentioned that. I actually do an independent study with a few of my students. I did it a few times. We actually, we try to launch our own startup. We've all failed spectacularly, but we did as a, we did it as a uh, independent study for a semester. But um, these were students that were more entrepreneurial, but they loved it. They had such a blast. My students told me that's the hardest they worked in all the four years of college, but they just had a great time doing it. If you're like an entrepreneur, that's like your kind of thing. That's your kind of thing. Any other questions? We probably have time for maybe one or two more. I did put the bait information in the chat box so you guys can click on that link so you can see the courses. We have the professor's email address in there if you want to connect with him. Um, Ariane, are you giving me a high five or do you have a question? Yeah, actually, this is Ariane's dad. Oh, uh, he, he, hi, how are you? Ariane, Hello, Ariane's dad. I didn't left for the, for his baseball game, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I had a question for the bait. Do we have to, uh, like, he has applied for business school, so does he have to apply? How does that work? I mean, uh, is it selected the group of uh, students that can be admitted into bait, or he can select bait as a freshman? No, no, no. Once you get into the business school, right? I think, how do you, I think it's after sophomore year you get into the business school? Right. Right. So, yeah, so I can answer. So everybody will start as a pre-business major unless they're a transfer student who are coming in ready to declare their major. But first years all come in 
as pre-business students, once they finish their six pre-business courses, which are intro to micro, intro to macro, intro to stats for business, calculus, and intro to financial accounting, um, and computer applications for business, once those courses are complete, which is typically your second semester of sophomore year, then you're able to declare any of the majors. We're not like other business schools where there's a GPA requirement because we're competitive on the front end. So once admitted to the business school, you'll be able to declare any of the six majors that we have. Okay, because I had heard previously, so maybe I was mistaken that, uh, you know, everything else like accounting, finance, finance, all the concentrations are okay. But if you wanted to go into bait, you have to meet certain criteria. So maybe that's not correct then. That is not correct. There's a lot of misinformation. You are hearing it from me, the admissions officer. So you will be able to declare major. We do well, declare bait as a major. We don't limit the number. Well, we not were actually, just so you know, when we had a department meeting, we were just, we were actually thinking about that, about having a separate requirement for the, yes, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whoa. We, were, we were trying to be elitist, and then it got, <laughs> but it got, uh, it got shot down in our department. It was just among our department. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry, Christine. We were we're bait to premise. I'm sorry. It's please, the other side of bait. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Another question or so? Any concerns? Anything keeping you up at night that you just need to know? Oh, we have one. How is majoring in accounting and concentrating in bait? Yeah, so I have a lot of students that do that as well. I, in fact, I always tell my accounting students that, listen, it's always good when you're doing, first of all, accounting is a fantastic, fantastic fundamental degree to have because financial world, business world, everything is financial statements, right? Um, but I always tell my students that, look, always have another minor or major or concentration with accounting because after you become a CPA, after a few years, you have to make a decision. Are you going to just be an accountant at a, a big firm? Or are you going to switch pivot careers with your accounting background, which a lot of accountants do, by the way, right? I worked uh, when I was working at the uh, asset back, when I was a desk client at the asset back securities and CDOs trading firm, one of our salespeople, he had a tax background, a tax accounting background, right? But he was, he was doing sales in asset back and CDO, CDO securities, and it blended perfectly. Um, when I was at Citigroup, oh, I went to Citigroup, I was working on the trading desk at Citigroup also for one year, I, I got to mention that. When I was a city for a year, one of my, um, one of our, I would say our, our tax quants working next to me, he was from the accounting world, right? And we would basically, he would work with corporations to help figure out the best, uh, the most efficient way to hedge their, whatever, whatever risks they had using the different tax codes. And he was on the trading desk with me. So yes, accounting and the bait, my, uh, the bait, the bait, I'm sorry, concentration is a fantastic, fantastic combination as well. Right. And the um, Professor O'Rourke will be giving her session this evening at seven. So you can catch me there after this. Um, so if you want to find out more about accounting, I would really recommend you pop into her session as well. Anyone else? We probably have time for one more question. So if I wanted to double major in bait and comp sci, would I take both the pre-business and the required pre-comp side classes before I declare my majors. Would you do that? So what you would need to do, instead of taking computer applications for business, you would take intro to comp sci because that will cover both your comp sci elective and your business school elective. Um, I'm not sure what it is that you need to declare your major in comp sci. You'd have to look up on the School of Arts and Sciences page to see what those prereqs are. I'm sure that you need the calculus and the intro to comp sci. I know that they, they go into like linear algebra and things. It's very, um, very quantitative programs. So you'd want to look that up. But for the business school, it's just the six pre-business before you declare your major. I'm not sure what it is for comp sci, but you can look that up on, again, the School of Arts and Science page. Last one, what would be the best concentration with bait? <laughs> oh, I, I, again, I can't answer that, <laughs> right? That depends on where you want to go, where your interests lie, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm obviously, I, if, 
if it was me, I would probably be doing, I would probably do a double major with bait and finance, but that's, that's because that was my, uh, my interest. My interest lied more in, in wall street and in the investment world. Right. So it's all about where your interest lies. I think we also, there's an entrepreneurship minor or something like that in a business school, right? Not minor, but there's an entrepreneurship concentration, but I know guys, there's a lot of questions on this, but just for me to clear this up, you're not going to be able to declare a double major, a minor or a concentration until your second year at RBF. Yeah. And we give you these block step classes so that you are going to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and really see what it is that you're leaning towards. So I know my first years, they have a whole laundry list. I want to do a double major. I want to do this. You know, we recommend, you know, meeting with the professors once you get there, going to some of the clubs and organizations, learning more about it to see what you're gravitating towards because you can't do it in your first year anyway. So you have some time to make it up. So with that, I'm going to leave it here. This session is being recorded. It will be up on the RBS website, hopefully by tomorrow. So you can go back and you can listen um, and be able to access the information in the chat box. So thank you, Professor, for your time and talking to us. Thank you, students, for joining us. I'm off to supply chain management. So if any of you want to join me there, that's where I'm going. And then I'll see you at accounting at seven. So we've got a, a busy lineup for you guys. So good luck. Hit the button. Come to Rutgers. All right, guys. Good luck, everybody. I'll see All some right, of you. Guys. I'll see some of you guys at Rutgers. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. Bye.